Take a deep breath. Take a couple of deep breaths. Get a sense of the energy in your body, the energy of the breathing, and what other, other energy, whatever other energy there may be there. Think of everything being coordinated, everything getting along. Each breath as it comes in, have it mingle harmoniously with the breath energy already there. You can focus your attention on any one spot in the body that seems convenient, or you can think of the body as a whole right from the start. The choice is yours. What's important is that you allow the breath to be a good place to stay, a comfortable place. The body seems tired or weak, think of breathing in a way that's more energizing. If you're tense, think of a way of breathing that's more relaxing. If your mind feels scattered, think of everything coming together with a sense of unity right here. What you're trying to do is create a place where the mind can settle down and just look and see what's going on in as balanced and impartial a way as possible. This is how you train it, because the untrained mind is generally confused. We live in a world of a lot of conflicting opinions. We often find ourselves going in one direction, and there's a voice that says, no, you've got to go in another direction. We go in that other direction, there's another voice that says, no, you've got to go back in the first one or third one. We feel we're pulled around all the time. And although as a general social principle or political principle, it might be good to say, well, let's honor diversity, that there are lots of different opinions in the world, still you want to find a set of opinions that you can live by. So you can make choices that are consistent, that go in a direction where you want to go. And so what do you do? There's that famous passage in the Galama Sutta. The famous passage, the famous part, is the one where the Buddha says, don't just go by text, don't go by what teachers say just because they're your teacher. Don't go by traditions. Sounds like, well, just listen to yourself. But then you look inside yourself and you see there are all these voices in there. You don't know which one is the one that's really going to guide you. And the Buddha himself actually says that in a lesser known part of that passage, which is don't go simply by your idea of what's reasonable or what you like. So where does that leave you? He says, look at your actions. When you know for yourself that something is skillful, then you follow that. Or if a particular teaching leads you in a skillful direction, follow that teaching. In other words, you have to test things in your actions. This is the only way you're going to get over your confusion, the only way you're going to get over your doubt. And to do this kind of test, you have to be as centered and as mindful and as alert as possible, because you have to look at your actions in terms of their intentions. You look at the action itself while you're doing it, and you look at the results that come out. And in all these areas, we tend to be pretty unalert. They've done tests on people. They hypnotize them and say, you're going to do X. And then as they come out of hypnosis, then they find themselves doing X. And then they're asked, why did you do X? And they'll give a reason. They say, oh, I felt like it. I wanted to do it, whatever. And the experimenters have said that this is just proof that we don't really have free will. We think we have free will, we think we have choice, but we don't. All that it shows is that people who are easily hypnotized can be very deluded about their motives. And this goes for everybody whose mind is untrained. We tend to be deluded about why we do things, partly because there are some motives that we're not really happy about. We don't like to see ourselves act on them, so we just cover up our eyes. 
like those aliens, I forgot what they're called in Slaughterhouse-Five, who live throughout time. They can see all of time all at once, and they see the end of the universe. And the person who's talking says, well, what do you do when you see the end of the universe? They say, well, we cover our eyes. That doesn't make it go away. And the same goes for our actions. We're not really paying attention to what we're doing because we're often thinking about what are you going to do next. Or you think about what you want to get out of the action and you're not really looking at what you're doing. And then as for the results, again, sometimes we don't like the results of our actions, so we close our eyes. This is where so much delusion in our lives. And if we actually looked at these three stages of action, when you first look at them, it's pretty disconcerting. You see all the different things in your mind that you really don't like, all the unskillful voices, all the unskillful motives. This is why you want to get the breath as comfortable as possible so you get yourself in a good mood, feeling settled, at ease. So you can see the mind's negative states without getting sucked into them, without getting depressed by them, without getting upset. Say, oh yeah, there's that too. This is where that image of the mind as a committee is useful. Because you can decide, okay, there are these members of the committee, but I don't have to go along with them. They may be campaigning, they may be trying to influence me in a particular direction. And it may have been the case that I've given in to them many times in the past, but I don't have to give in to them now. I'll just watch them for a while. And it may be disconcerting to see that, yes, I've been nurturing all these beasts inside the mind. But the first step in learning how, how, learning how not to be overpowered by them is to recognize them and also to realize that you do have the opportunity to step back. This is how you begin to exert your free will. Exert your power of choice. Not by making up a narrative of why you do something, but actually looking at what's there and making a choice. As the Buddha once said, if it weren't possible for people to choose the skillful course of action or to develop skillful mental states, he wouldn't have taught it. But it is possible. And if it weren't beneficial, to develop skillful mental states. He wouldn't have taught that either, but it is beneficial, so that's why he taught it. And it wasn't the case that he was working with perfect human beings back then. Everybody had the same kinds of greed, anger, delusion, fear, jealousy, pride, hypocrisy, and all the things that we don't like about ourselves. These are not recent inventions. They've been with the human race since who knows when. This is why it's useful when you sit down to meditate to think about the Buddha's awakening. His first knowledge had to do with his past lives. We sit here thinking about the narratives of our life. He had you know, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of narratives to look at. But he didn't get sucked into them. He just noticed, oh, okay, there's that. The next question is, well, how about everybody else? Do they say, have the same issues, the same problems? And what pattern is there in this? Because when you look at one person's narratives, it's hard to see patterns. But when you look at the world as a whole, he said you saw everybody passing away and then being reborn, and being reborn in line with their karma, based on what they had done. What they had done was based on their views, and their views were based on who they respected, or who they listened to, which points of view they picked up whether from noble people or not from noble people. Notice that movement goes from individual narratives to looking at the world as a whole, and then focusing on the present moment. So it's good to think about that when you find yourself tied up in defilements in the mind, unskillful mental states in the mind that you really don't feel comfortable with. Remind yourself, everybody has these, to a greater or lesser extent. And everybody's been through them. So 
So it's not that you're particularly bad or particularly confused. This is part of the general pattern. And the whole purpose of the practice is to work with that general pattern, to bring it in line with the Buddha's third insight, which is how you can put an end to suffering by developing skillful qualities. And then as you develop mindfulness and alertness and try to keep them as continuous as possible, then you begin to see the connection between your motivations and the actual actions while they're happening, what choices you're making, and then the results that come about it. Again, oftentimes we don't see the connection between our actions and the results because we aren't paying constant attention. We're jumping around here and there and the other place. It's like a needle on a record. If the needle were to jump around, you get zip, zap, zip, zap could make any sense out of it at all. But if the needle stays in the groove, you get a continuous story, the continuous song, the continuous narrative. You see how things are connected. Then if you see that a particular action or motivation was a mistake, then you go back and look at it again. Learn how to compensate for it. Learn how to Make up your mind that you're not going to do that particular mistake again. You've seen the connection, and it's important that you see that it's not necessary. If you're stymied as how to deal with it, then you go talk to somebody else. This is the other part of the Kalama Sutta that tends to get ignored, is that listening to the counsel of the wise. I mean, there are other people who have been on this path before you. Starting with the Buddha and going through all of his noble disciples. So you want to look around. Well, who around you is wise? This, of course, depends on your own powers of observation. So again, it comes back down to your own honesty. This is why the Buddha asked for someone who was one, observant, and two, truthful. He would teach that person the Dharma. So in this way, the practice is a process of feeling your way. But it's only through noticing what's skillful and what's unskillful in the mind in terms of what results you get by acting on which voices, which intentions. That's how you overcome doubt. That's how you overcome confusion. So this is why the Buddha said you want to notice what, when you put into practice, is skillful and what is not. What is Praised by the wise, what's criticized by the wise. This is the way, the only way you're going to get past all the confusion of voices in your head, the confusion of voices around you. It requires patience. It requires a certain amount of stability, consistency, stamina. And this is why we work with the breath. It's not something boring just to come back to. It's our standing point. And you make it your standing point by learning how to make it comfortable. So you get a sense of ease. It feels like it suffuses the body. Don't think of the body as this clunky, solid object sitting here that you've got to expand and contract, expand and contract. Think of this large, amorphous energy field where the patterns of tension are unnecessary, where the boundaries or blockages are unnecessary. Just imagine everything penetrating everything else. So there's an easy flow of energies, an easy flow of whatever is moving in the body. You don't have to impose limits. You don't have to impose boundaries on things. And so you develop a place where you can take a stance. And you can stay here with a sense of ease and well-being, a sense of belonging here. Because when you're going to see your motivations, where are you going to see them? You're going to see them right here. When you see your actions, where are they going to be? Well, you're going to see them right here. When you see the results of your actions, where are you going to see them right here? So this is the best seat in the house. Everything you need to see, you can see from this position. 
and as things get more balanced, you find a greater equilibrium. You find yourself in a better and better position to see things clearly. It's like a scientist running an experiment. If you put your equipment on a table, you want to make sure the table is solid. And the table, the solid table is standing on a solid floor. That way the measurements you get out of the equipment are more likely to be precise, accurate, reliable. The Buddha has a statement that the self is its own mainstay, i.e. your mind is its own mainstay, but it can be its own mainstay only if you develop it. What's going to develop the mind? Well, the mind's going to develop the mind. But it's only through this constant process of settling in and watching what your intentions are, what your actions are, what the results are. That's how you develop the quality of learning how to be more and more reliable to yourself, more and more your own mainstay. This is how you work your way out of confusion.